Next topic is going to be reactive terminations. This is starting to get into some grown-up expertise. We've been we've mastered the resistor. Now let us introduce the capacitor and the inductor at the end of the line. Why would we do such a thing? Because we like making your life miserable? Well, we do the, do that. But the other reason we do it is because on high-speed circuits, a lot of the devices aren't purely resistive. There's parasitic capacitance in the lead going into the chip, for example. Or in the chip itself, there's a, some parasitic inductance leading into the device segment that you're, you're driving your signal. And so how does that change our analysis? We'll still get reflections. Uh, the same principle will, principles will hold, but we'll get some slight distortions, and we'll learn how to deal with those distortions over the next lecture. So let's see. Reactive terminations. We know, for example, that if my termination... is an open circuit where RL is equal to infinity and the reflection coefficient at the load is equal to plus one, my steady state load will look something like this. One transit time will elapse before a signal is switched into the network. And then the voltage will jump up to 2V plus and remain there if the source is matched. The steady state source, if we put a voltmeter on that, what we would see is a V plus that enters the line at that level two transit times will elapse and then the voltage will jump up to 2V plus. Again, if the source is matched. The short circuit <coughs> RL equals to zero gamma sub L is equal to negative one. In this scenario I don't see nothing at my load, my steady state load. The waveform comes down, it reflects with negative one reflection coefficient, so the total voltage is still zero, as it should be at a short circuit. And in the case of my steady state source, what I see is I excite a V plus. Two transit times later, it has been erased from the line and I go back down to zero. This is all a review at this point, right? Should be. Okay, here's the brain teaser. We still got our match source, but instead of an open or a short, uh, short circuit, I'm gonna put a capacitor. At the load. What does the steady state load and the steady state source do? Well, we already actually cheated. We, we introduced the capacitor last lecture. But let's go ahead and look at the actual transient. Trace the voltage as it goes through. And see if we can get the telltale uh, response of a capacitor out of this network. Remember, capacitors look like short circuits the instant that they get connected to a DC circuit. Then over time, they look like open circuits. And so not surprisingly, without even really doing a lot of math, what's going to happen is at the load at time equals to T, uh, capital T, I'm going to see zero volts up until then, and then it's going to look like a short circuit. So I'm going to have zero volts afterwards. 
And in the long run, I'm going to go up to an open circuit where I should get 2V plus. And so the transient looks like this. Asymptotically approaches 2V plus with this standard exponential decay. At the source side, what do I see? Well, it's again a combination of my short circuit initially and then my open circuit eventually. So in, from a source side perspective, it looks kind of strange. I have a graph that looks like this. Flat. Then at two transit time, it dies because it looks kind of like a short circuit. But then it charges up asymptotically approaching 2V+. plus. So it kind of looks like the, the open circuit, except it's got that divot taken out of it. Let me quickly graph the inductor case. For the inductor, we have an inductive element across the bottom, uh, across the load. My steady state load graph is going to be a combination of <coughs> initially an open circuit and in the long run a short circuit because that's the, the inductor transient. Initially it looks like an open circuit, eventually becomes a short circuit. And so what I'll see at time equals to t, what was a zero voltage output jumps up to 2V plus, whatever voltage was put on that line, and then decays exponentially until it looks like a short circuit at the load. And finally, at the source, source side, what I see is an initial voltage that I send down. It gets to the end, <clears throat> and it starts to look like an open circuit. So it jumps up like this. But over time, with the same exponential decay, it goes down and looks like a short circuit. <laughs> so here's the, the $50 question. When you were studying this kind of circuit where you had a, a resistor and say a capacitor connected to a source and you had one of these questions where you know you switch this in at time equals to zero that capacitor would charge up with a, a, a exponential form waveform and we have a time constant right time constant would be RC in a transmission line like the one uh, that's connected to a capacitor like this. I got a capacitance, a transmission line with intrinsic impedance Z naught, and I've got a matched source. How do I compute the time constant of that discharge? Charge or dis discharge, either way. What value for resistance do I use? Well, we would look at the equivalent circuit model, right? We know that the general model says that a transmission line always looks like a source in parallel with a Z naught at either terminal. So at some point this voltage is going to be zero and then it's going to switch on. It's like I just closed a switch with a source, a resistor, and a capacitor in series. So for that kind of circuit, my time constant is going to be Z naught 
times C. If there was an inductor at the end of the line, by extension, my time constant for the inductor would be L over Z naught. So the resistive value that I use is actually the impedance of the transmission line connected to the reactive component. Other than that, everything you learned about RC uh, and LC and RLC and RL circuits holds with the transmission line. What we're going to do when we come back on Tuesday to ground out this talk on uh, reactive components, uh, Professor Tom Michaels has actually put together a little demo on a TDR, time domain reflectometer. Anybody ever used a TDR? No? It's actually a $14,000 piece of equipment, so I don't blame you. But uh, we'll use it, and I, hopefully I'll get it uh, on the screen and we can take a look at what these things actually look at and actually do real-time swap outs of capacitors, inductors, and combinations of resistors after we do a little more analysis. So I'll see you on Tuesday. Um, okay, well then let's get into our discussion. We're going to continue our discussion of reactive terminations. Inductors and capacitors and their effects when they're connected to transmission lines. And we have a special treat today. So uh, what I I have here, I've brought in uh, a piece of equipment that Professor Tom Michaels uh, was able to purchase for 3025 and he set up some demos for it which is really nice because it illustrates using real live test and measurement equipment uh, some of the time domain and, and um, reflection and reactive component principles that we're currently learning in electromagnetics. And the device over there, believe it or not, that little blue box costs $14,000. It is a time domain reflectometer. Or, if you are super cool and in the know, you just call it a TDR. And it is probably one of the most expensive ways to test cables you can possibly manage, but that's one of its primary functions. What it does, and when you look at the electrical equivalent of what this thing is doing, you're going to be embarrassed for the person that spent $14,000 on this. But I'll explain why. It's such an important piece of equipment. This is what it does. It has a very well-calibrated voltage source, DC, a very carefully matched 50 ohm impedance a switch and then a very precise voltmeter here which effectively is what you're seeing on the output of the screen. I'll, we'll get over to the screen in a second. So what it does, it just kind of clicks down very quickly, a nice sharp transient, so you get a perfect uh, DC switch source into here. You, you can see this, the magnitude of that source as it propagates down the line, and then some manner of time later, you'll get to the end, there may or may not be a reflection of some sort, and it will propagate backwards, and you will register the reflection as well as the total voltage. Now this looks trivial from a circuit diagram, but this is actually a very difficult thing to do because um, the uh, uh, tri transmission line here, you, you're looking at things that occur on the nanosecond or even picosecond scale uh, in, with respect to time. So you've got to have a very accurate DC source that can take loading at that scale. And you also have to have a very precise voltmeter that's sampling literally billions of times a second to generate the waveform that we see over there. One of the most important uses for the TDR in practice is for testing cables. Because, for example, if you've got a coaxial cable and it's 20 uh, meters long, what you should see when you click this thing and you don't have a load on the end of that coaxial cable, you'll see an initial waveform propagate onto the cable. Hopefully it's matched so half of this source will make it onto the cable, propagate down. 
reflect back with plus one reflection coefficient. And then some manner of time later, you'll see that hit the matched source side, and then you'll get a jump up. And you'll see uh, 100, you know, the, the full voltage that you put across there. So you can see basically a stair-step response in time. And by looking at the time scale, you can see where that open circuit is. And that's really a crucial piece of information. If that cable is damaged, uh, it's shorted out some mysterious location along the line, you can't always tell that from just mechanically looking at it. Um, you can actually see the reflection on the TBR and measure it and say, oh wow, you know, based on the velocity of propagation that I've entered into my TDR, it says that the, the break is actually occurring uh, four meters down the line. So clearly there's something wrong with that coaxial cable. That's actually a very important um, piece of equipment and it saves a tremendous amount of labor in industry. It doesn't sound like it, but when you've got a bum cable, that can be really hard to test, especially if you're doing something very complicated. I have a, uh, some, some former Georgia Tech students that work for Boeing, for example, and they tell me one of the biggest problems they have when they're putting their planes together. If you think about it, think of the enormous amount of wiring that goes into to planes. You've got to have all the data connections that you know, allow you to watch direct TV in the seat in front of you with a little uh, television unit. And there's lighting, wiring, wiring to switches, the radio console for each passenger. And there's all the telemetry and avionics and the cockpit that have to have, be connected to sensors and, and things all over the, uh, uh, the plane at various locations. There's literally miles and miles of cabling inside the plane. And what happens if there's a short somewhere? How do you find it? Do you just take the plane apart and unwind millions of, of uh, uh, you know, feet of, of, of wires? No. What you do is you take your TDR out and you test the various connections that you suspect are problems and you can actually look where the short is physically down the, the line. Uh, and th you know, when you think about how many hundreds of hours or thousands of hours of engineering time that they save uh, for each troubleshoot in a case like that, you can see why they might want to charge $14,000 for a really precise piece of test and measurement equipment like this. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what it does. And uh, Ebony, you've done a magnificent job of getting that centered. That turned out way better than I was expecting. So I did, I had this precariously set up vertically, and uh, on the video you can see the screen of the output. Over here is my coaxial cable. It's currently open circuited. And so here's my initial excitation. It jumps up as it initially gets connected to the matched 50 ohm line. And then sometime later here, down the line, it, uh, it jumps up because there's basically an open circuit at the end of the line. We know that that causes the open circuit voltage to double up. The same amount of voltage reflects back and it eventually doubles up at the source as well. Okay, so this is about a 12 meter long cable. Let's see, let's see what we can connect to it. Yes, do you have a question? That's No, this is real time. You'll see as soon as I hit the make the change, you will see the real time reflection change. So I have here in my hand a short circuit. A short circuit. Okay. Oh, does that make sense? Yeah, that's right. Short circuit, I send the waveform down and then it reflects with a minus one reflection coefficient. So the backwards traveling waveform eventually erases itself. Remember, in your undergraduate circuits class, you only studied everything to the right of this. Like, oh, I have a short circuit at the end of my line. I get zero voltage across it. Well, that's true, but this has got to happen first. Pretty cool, huh? Okay. Let me see. I have a much shorter cable here that uh, Professor Michaels has put in a kit. This is kind of interesting. What do you think you're going to see? I've got the, this actually terminates in some kind of alligator clips here. So it's kind of a short circuit. What do you see? What do you think is going to change with respect to what we just saw? Well, I should see a short circuit um, load, but it should be a lot shorter, right? Oh, and there. Look at that. I see that's exactly what happens. Sort of. Let me change the time scale. You see I'm getting some ballast, uh, some interference, probably from my wireless device. Let me just turn this off for a second, see if it hap what happens. 
Okay, back on. <laughs> I don't know if the people at home can hear me though. We're in the video links. Let's just put it over here. Okay, so what's happening there? Well, it looks kind of like a short circuit. We're off. But uh, what's happening there? It doesn't look exactly like a short circuit. What does it look kind of like? An inductor, that's right. We said inductors look like open circuits when the load first hits them. And then they eventually look like short circuits. And that's exactly what's happening here. We got that kind of jump up like it's an inductive open circuit that exponentially decays into a short circuit response. Now why is that? Well again, this is not something that you would consider in low frequency electronics, but what do I have here? It's a coil. It's only one turn, but it's got some inductance to it, and that's actually what we're registering on the end of the reflection there. So let's see. Let's see, what other things can we connect to? Okay, now I have to be careful here. This is a capacitor. And one of the problems with capacitors is that they can hold charge, especially when you're walking around on carpet. Uh, so you have to worry about like electrostatic discharge. One of the best ways to destroy a $14,000 piece of equipment is to uh, connect a component that has a few hundred volts of electrostatic charge on it. It's actually very easy to build that up. Uh, in static electricity because it doesn't take that many joules of energy, right? A little capacitor, you can build up voltage very quickly with just a few um, uh, coulombs, you know, nanocoulombs of, uh, of charge. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to touch both terminals to my metal simultaneously to make sure it's discharged. And then... I'm going to connect it like that. See, that's kind of like an RLC circuit. In fact, you can't even really see the capacitor transient. Let me go ahead and switch back to my longer cable. That'll be a little more informative. That'll be nice because I don't see that wireless transient either on the long cable. Good, good study in electromagnetic interference. Okay, there's my open circuited long cable. And now let me touch it with a capacitor. Discharge to make sure it doesn't have charge on it. And then, let me see if I can get this. Oh, yeah. So that's doing the opposite of the, uh, the inductor. It's starting out like it's a short circuit, and then it you know, transients to double the voltage. Pretty cool, huh? Let's try this. Uh, I've got what I believe to be a matched load. I think that's uh, 200 ohm resistors in parallel. Let me try see if that works. Oh yeah, there we go. The perfect match. No reflection. In between the open and the short. Now I've got here another example. This one is another hack job. Uh, somebody connected 100 ohms to a coaxial cable termination. What would you expect to see here? 50 ohm line, 100 ohm connection. Well, what's the reflection coefficient? positive one-third. So we should see a little jump up at the end that's roughly a third of what we put down, right? Let's see if that works out. Yeah, pretty good, huh? Uh, approximately a third, yeah. Probably within the tolerance of all of our measurements here, at least. Okay, here's the brain teaser. The last thing to look at here. What I have here... Professor Michaels put in a really nice brain teaser. He's, I've got uh, a, a wound resistor. So you, you know most of the discrete resistors that you get 
uh, in your electronics lab are, you know, they kind of adjust the geometry, the cross-sectional area and the length of like some carbon, some resistive carbon material. And they rely on a sh very small compact geometry to get a uh, specific amount of resistance. Well, this is just wire, which doesn't have a lot of resistance, but they just get the resistance by winding it a lot. And you know you can kind of carefully calibrate and control what value of resistance you get. Then you cover the thing in epoxy, and you've got a fairly precise resistive value. So the question now is, what do you think that looks like? It's basically a resistor in series with a what? An inductor. Let's see. So it should kind of look like an inductor, but instead of going to a short circuit, it should go to whatever the reflection coefficient is of this thing, right? That makes sense? Okay, there we go. Whew. All that for this drama dramatic moment of the wound resistor. Oh yeah, there it is. The same inductive transient, except instead of going to zero, let me change the time scale here, it goes to ah, roughly match. This is probably, if we put this on an ohm meter, we'd find it's probably between 50 and 100 ohms. So that's decaying, and when the inductor becomes a short circuit, it really looks like a 50 or 100 ohm load, and you're getting little reflection at the, at the end of the transient. So pretty neat. Uh, I'll probably have this in my office for a couple more days before I return it to Professor Michaels. So if you'd like to take a look at it and play around with it, uh, you're, you're welcome to take a, take a look at it. Okay. Let me disassemble my, on my cables and stuff. Okay. Well, good. Any questions about the TDR? Turn this off. Okay. Well, now that we've got the intro to reactive elements, I'm going to go through and I'm going to work an example. Let's figure out how to do some rigorous analysis on these elements. So if we look at reactive terminations and how to calculate time constants, If I have a capacitive termination, then my transmission line end kind of looks like this. I've got this dependent voltage source, which is 2V plus. We could call this total V naught. I've got an intrinsic impedance Z naught. And really, when it's a discharge line, it looks like there's really nothing there. And when it, uh, a pulse, a V plus strikes the end of the line, it's like you're connecting it into the circuit all of a sudden. And so this is electrically the scenario that we, we diagram at the end of the line. And this has a very simple solution that you've already studied before. And other the fact that this Z0 is actually the intrinsic impedance with which voltage and current are transmitted on the transmission line, uh, the analysis is a simple RC circuit. What is the load voltage going to look like as a function of time? Well, we know the general solution looks something like this. VL as a function of time is going to be equal to V0, whatever voltage I put across this thing, times 1 minus EXP minus T over time constant. And that will show up at time T greater than 0. So I'm going to put a unit step function there. And that time constant is what? RC. That's right. RC seconds. I have units of seconds. And we'll uh, show what the decay is as that thing charges up. If I looked at this as a function of time, I got nothing before time equals to zero. I got nothing immediately afterwards because the 
capacitor is initially going to look like a short circuit, but it is quickly going to charge up asymptotically to the final value, which in this simple circuit is going to be V0, or twice the impinging voltage. So that's the mathematical expression of what we just saw in the TDR. I might as well put it up here for symmetry, but if you happen to have an inductor at the end of your line, line still looks like the same switched DC source when a pulse comes down and strikes the, the end. 2V plus. But now it's connected to an inductor. In that case, my load voltage as a function of time is going to be V sub L as a function of time is going to be equal to V naught, the final, uh, the initial value, because, of course, whatever voltage comes down and strikes this, the total source voltage will initially, at time equal to zero, appear across the inductor. Inductors look like opens initially, shorts eventually. So it starts off with V naught and then X exponentially decays according to a time constant, exp to the minus t over tau. And of course all of this happens at unit step t for time values greater than zero. In this case, the tau, the time constant, is what? R over L. Is it R over L or Z over, uh, L over R? Should be L over R, I think, right? And then when I write R, that's our generic formula. These are actually the Z naughts of the transmission line, right? Mm -hmm. What would we expect this curve to look like? It'll jump up because it looks like an open circuit, jump up to the value V naught and exponentially decay. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and do a more sophisticated example. So here's my example. We're going to look, using our analysis, at the effects of a reactive load on a high-speed circuit line, high-speed digital circuit line. So we're going to take a line that has about one nanosecond of transit time to it. T equals one nanosecond. It'll be our standard 50 ohm transmission line. Z naught is equal to 50 ohms. It's connected to a source that switches in, basically switches in at time equals to zero, and then switches, uh, let me draw the arrows right, switches in at time equal to zero, out at time equal to 200 picoseconds. So this is a short 200 picosecond pulse. And let's assume that uh, this is matched, Z naught, and we'll make the amplitude 10 volts. Now over on this side, we're assuming maybe this is a microstrip line and it's feeding a logic device. Or maybe it could, at one nanosecond, you're getting to the, uh, to the scale of, of literally millimeters of, um, of travel um, on a circuit board, or centimeters. And if this were to drop much further, you could even use this as a representative case going from like a core to another core within a microprocessor. That happens at the picosecond scale, uh, those pulse transits. So in this case, we've got a logic device at the end, which we in traditionally have uh, been modeling as purely resistive, high impedance, in this case, say 200 ohms. But now let's put a realistic... 5 picofarad capacitor there. Now what does that capacitor represent in a realistic scenario? Well, it could be a couple of different things. First of all, 
If this is literally terminating a microstrip line and going into a logic device, this could be the parasitic capacitance that exists between the two leads. You know, the chip's got uh, uh, an electronic lead that comes out that you solder to your microstrip line, and then maybe it's got a ground pin that uh, you take a metallized conductive via and connect it to the ground plane. And because those are two pieces of metal that are close to each other, they're going to have some intrinsic capacitance shunting them. Probably what's even more likely is that this is some sort of transistor and there's some uh, gate to source capacitance um, as you get the two metallizations very close to one another in, for example, some sort of really small, very large scale integration CMOS circuit. You know, the, the, your gate and your drain and your source are really close to one another. Those pieces of metal are going to have intrinsic capacitance between them and that's going to cause some parasitics as well. So recognize that we're, we're not just capriciously adding complicated elements because we just like to make your life complicated. We're trying to model some serious realism here in your lo high-speed logic uh, devices. So in the time domain, my input voltage looks something like this. Time equals to zero, jumps up to 10 volts, and then some... 200 picoseconds later, it drops down to zero volts. And this could be a clock cycle or a data bit of some sort. So let's see, how does this parasitic capacitance distort the, the situation? Okay, so we're going to go and solve this. Step number one, is we're going to apply a time-honored electrical engineering technique for the solution of this problem. Linear superposition. Because in the, at the end of the day, I've only taught you how to deal with switched DC sources. I haven't taught you anything about pulses in the presence of capacitances and inductances. However, every pulse is really just a couple of DC signals added together in disguise. So what we're going to do... We're going to look at this pulse that jumped up to 10 volts and then back down in time. That's our input. 200 picoseconds. What we're going to treat this as, as a switch DC problem that jumps up to 10 volts at t equals 0 and it persists through all infinity. Call this VN1. And then we're going to add to it this other input, which is a negative DC pulse that switches in 200 picoseconds later to a negative 10 volt value. And the reason why this is so powerful, we'll call this VN2 is because we know how to solve this problem. This is a simple time constant problem. We use the general formulas we'd already put on the board to solve it. And according to a linear system of which anything that has resi only resistors, capacitors, inductors, and lossless basic transmission lines in it can be viewed as a linear system, then if I can write an input as the sum of two or more different inputs, I can study the solutions to those individual inputs, and if the input is the sum of those inputs, then the output will be the sum of those outputs. That's a very powerful principle in electrical engineering that we use all the time. And it turns hard problems into really simple problems. We know how to solve this. In fact, if we know how to solve this, we automatically know how to solve this because we just flip the answer, answer, uh, amplitude of the solution and delay it with respect to time. Also, linear and time invariant this system that we're studying. So, okay, that's going to be our scenario. Now let's look at the end of the line and figure out what's going on. Okay. Here's the end of my transmission line, and I'm going to replace it 
with my 2V plus, which in this case is actually 10 volts, right? I have a 10 volt source, it's matched to a 50 ohm transmission line. As soon as I connect it to the transmission line, 5 volts dumps onto the line and propagates with constant velocity down to the end. So V plus is 5 volts, it doubles up when I write my equivalent circuit source, and that's going to be 10 volts. Intrinsic impedance is 50 ohms. And we got a capacitance of, uh, what would we say that was? Two hundred, uh, five picofarads and a resistance of 200 ohms. So really all I need to figure out is what is the steady state voltage and what is the time constant for the circuit. So steady state voltage, let's do that one first. That's going to be easy. Initially, capacitor looks like a short circuit, but it eventually becomes an open circuit. So I can ignore this in the steady state. This is eventually going to look like 10 volts in series with 50 ohms in series with 200 ohms. I use, to find my steady state, the voltage divider formula. My 10 volts times my voltage here across that resistor, 200, divided across these two resistors in series, which is 200 plus 50. And that winds up being 8 volts. The time constant, well, this might be a little bit difficult to see, but sometimes when I, when I look at circuit problems like this, you know, instead of coming up with the Thevenin equivalent, sometimes I like to make a Norton equivalent. Did you ever study that in your classes? Norton equivalent, that's where you, you turn this into a core current source. So this winds up being 2V plus over Z naught in parallel with the Z naught. And again, I'm not bending the world or doing anything illegal here. I'm just putting this in a different topolo topology that helps me recognize what the time constant truly is. So really, I can see that in my Norton equivalent, I got 200 ohms in parallel with 50. And that's really the resistance that this thing discharges across. So let's, let's try to 200 in parallel with 50 ohms. That's going to be 40 ohms, right? That's effectively what this system looks like. So my time constant is going to be 40 ohms times 5 picofarads or about 200 picoseconds. Time co Conveniently, the time constant of this system is about the order of my pulse width. So let me go over here. Let's start constructing a solution. Solution one is a time delayed exponential transient. There's going to be one transit time, one nanosecond in time before anything happens because of the latency of the transmission line. When it does happen, I have this exponential decay that asymptotically pro approaches 8 volts. Mathematically, I'm going to write that as v my steady state voltage, call it 8 volts, 1 minus EXP, a time-shifted version T minus 1 nanoseconds over tau, unit step T minus 1 nanoseconds. My solution number two, proceeding in the same manner, is going to be zero, this time delayed until the end of the pulse, which is 1.2 nanoseconds, 
and otherwise it's the exact same transient. I exponentially approach, in this case, it's a minus 8 volts. So when I sum those two together, The thing that I see at the end of the line, at one nanoseconds, is something that looks like this. At one point, one nanosecond, it exponentially rises up, hits a point where it starts to decay, and exponentially goes down to zero. Mathematically, the way I write this, is that my load voltage, label all the axes so I get full credit, hint, hint, units, volts. This whole thing looks like zero volts when time is less than one nanosecond at the end of the line. It looks like 8 times 1 minus EXP minus T minus 1 nanosecond over time constant 200 picoseconds. And this is for between 1 nanosecond and 1.2 nanosecond. And then when I'm in this third region here, I get 8 times really everything, right? EXP to the minus... Oh, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, where do we get the time, the 1 nanosecond and the 1.2 nanosecond? So the first nanosecond is because we're looking at the load output voltage, V sub L. And if we switch on the front side at T equals to zero, it's going to take 1 nanosecond to get all the way down there. And I think uh, that was on the given statement. Yeah, that, uh, okay. yeah that's a transit time. Okay. And then I got a minus, and then I got this other exponential, which is shifted by t minus 1.2 nanoseconds with a time constant of 200 picoseconds, the same time constant. And so this is for t greater than 1.2 nanoseconds. And there it is. We have mathematically and graphically solved our problem. Interesting to note that, you know, as a double check, it's always good to maybe plug in the value 1.2 nanoseconds. Plug it into this expression, into this expression, just to make sure they're continuous at that point. If you did that, you'd find out that this was about 5.06 volts. If the capacitor wasn't there, what would the reflection coefficient be at that junction? If the capacitor wasn't there, it would be 200 minus 50 over 200 plus 50. It'd be plus, was that, 3 fifths? The transmission coefficient would be plus 8 fifths. The voltage that I would get if the capacitor wasn't there would be a nice, fully formed 8 volt pulse that would end at 1.2 nanoseconds. Notice how the, the presence of parasitic capacitance has destroyed the solution, uh, the really nice waveform that we had on that. It's lowered the overall voltage. It's also added some latency. We're now going to have some additional latency, which in real high-speed circuits can be an issue as well. Not everything's going to be synchronized. And it also smears the waveform with respect to time. You can only tolerate this so much before you've destroyed your data on the, the transmission line. So, how would we calculate what would propagate down the reflected side of the line? What would be backwards propagating in this scenario? Well, 
remember, this is all due to a forward propagating waveform that would have been total voltage, total voltage without a capacitor, load voltage without a capacitor. Let me just superimpose on top of this my 5 volt waveform that strikes the end of the line. This is my V plus. We know that at the end of the line, my forwards and my backwards propagating wave add together to give my load voltage. They have to to have continuity across the boundary there. So by extension, this is my load voltage and I know it. And this is my forward propagating wave. I just subtract my forward propagating voltage from my load voltage and what should be left over is my backwards propagating waveform. So basically this minus this is equal to V minus. So what would that be? It would be something that kind of looked like this. Came up here, jumped up to 5 volts initially, exponentially went like this, and then Let's see, do I have that right? V minus that. This minus it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here we go, here we go. Uh, this minus that. And this minus nothing. So I get kind of this weird <laughs> transient propagating backwards with respect to time. So if you ever saw some weird looking waveform as a V minus hitting your source on a TDR scope or something like that, you know you've got some sort of mismatched capacitive junction. That's my backwards propagating waveform right there. Now, of course, you wouldn't see that on a TDR necessarily because this would be a short pulse, at least not the setup that we had there. Not a DC excitation that is left to persist. This is in the absence of any DC wave that's already on there. So any questions about this example? Okay, so let me explain this one more time. VL is equal to V plus plus V minus. If I want to solve for V minus, I know what my V plus is. It's a 5 volt waveform that lasts for 200 picoseconds. I know what my total load voltage is because that's the solution that I traced out here. So all I have to do, I'll go ahead and trace out with my marker, what is V minus? It's the subtraction of V plus from my total load voltage. And in that case, I've got start at zero, minus five volt, so it looks like this, jumps down, and then kind of comes up to here. And all of a sudden, I have a discontinuity. This thing kinks and starts to decay like this. My total voltage, my V plus vanishes, and so my new voltage is now something that just looks exactly like my V sub L. So it's, uh, if I were to graph it alone, it would look something like this. Kind of strange looking. Funny things happen on transmission lines when you have reactive components. This is not your resistive load. Okay, any more questions?